Isaiah chapter 54. We're beginning a new series of messages entitled, The Presence of Fertile Grace. The Presence of Fertile Grace. It's something about the grace of God. The awesome, wonderful expression of God's grace toward us. And as we look into this series, because in Isaiah 54, Isaiah says this. Verse 1, shout for joy, O barren one. You who have, not, you have born no child, break forth into joyful shouting and cry. Cry out, cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Here we see Isaiah is giving a charge, a call, and as we look at this part of this series, we're going to be dealing with the issue of responding to the presence of fertile grace. It's in this section that this chapter opens with a prophetic charge, a prophetic charge for Zion, the people of God, to rise up and respond with a loud voice to the realization of the goodness and the power and presence of Almighty God. But what's interesting here is that this charge is placed against the backdrop of a people who had been acquainted with and fixed within the emotional and mental experience of captivity. And here they are being charged to lift their voice and to begin to sing aloud to God, to joyfully begin to praise God. Understand, it's, it's like having your worst, worst, worst day. And somebody says, let's give him some praise. <laughs> and here Isaiah is saying to them, it's time to arise and declare the goodness of God. And here's a people who had found themselves fixed within the limitations of sterility and infertility as a nation. What does it mean to be sterile? It speaks to the absence, the absence of children, the absence of fruitfulness, the absence of seed, the absence of young. It also can speak to the absence of imagination, the absence of excitement, the absence of creativity. It means to be uninspired and unproductive. And here is a nation of people who would find themselves barren, sterile, infertile. And it's in this context that they would find themselves at this place because they were a people who no longer had an ear to hear what God was saying. And I love this because Isaiah and his commission to these people in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, turn there. Maybe you'll beat me there. Isaiah 6. And Isaiah is commissioned by God to this people. He said, then I heard, verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Can you say that? Here am I send me. He said, go and tell this people, keep listening, but do not perceive. Keep looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they may see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. This seems almost paradoxical in the presentation of it, but God is revealing something to the prophet. He's revealing that he's being sent to a people who don't want to change, who have a preset resistance against God, who are obstinate against the purpose of God. It's something about having good times. When you come into a season of good times, it's a possibility you believe you don't need God anymore. And you have no awareness at that point and sensitivity to his voice in your life. You I got it. We can work it. We can do this. And so they were resisting as Isaiah was preaching to a people who had issues. Do you know God sends people who are called to minister to people who have issues? Right? Did you know that? Did you know I'm called? Yes. 
And so he's helping. He wants to speak to the issues of a nation. He wants to see something happen, but imagine preaching to a people over and over and they don't change and they don't want to change. And you've been told in advance they're not going to change, but you're still, your calling is to preach to them. And he's preaching to them. He's proclaiming, he's revealing the mind of God. But these people had a set disposition and they at this point had pushed the limits. Because one thing about God, God is long suffering. I mean, he just, he just, he's merciful and gracious, but there's a point where there's a cutoff point for God, where God says enough is enough. God is not an enabler. God will give you opportunity to turn around, but he won't let you stay in where you are, stay in that position. So here Isaiah is preaching and Isaiah gets the word that enough is enough. The wrath of God is coming. Judgment is coming. They will be taken into captivity. Now you would think a people who had known captivity would not want to go back to captivity. You know, if you have been in Egypt, you don't want to be in Assyria in captivity. If you've been in Egypt, you don't want to be in, in Babylon in captivity. captivity. So, so a people who had known captivity, why would they set themselves to go back up into captivity? Unless we are living with a mentality, it's all about today. Don't have learned from the history in our past. We're just about what works for us today. And Isaiah is speaking to these people. Now, one thing, one thing about this, and we need to know this about God. As the Israelites, as the people of God are resistant toward God and they become faithless, I love this about God. He remains to be faithful. And what God is saying, you're going to go through your season. You're going to have your hardship. You're going to go through captivity. But on the other side of it, there's a new day coming. And in Isaiah chapter 52, he says to the people of God, he's talking about the prophetic promise of fertile grace. There's a prophetic declaration, fertile grace is coming. For he says, arise or awake, awake. Clothe yourself in your strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the city, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer come into you. Shake yourself from the dust. Rise up, O captive Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the chains around your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. He's saying to them that there's a promise of a new day. There's a promise of grace coming. There's a promise of a new season. There's a promise of breakthrough. But you gotta love this about God. God says, I'm gonna do my part but you got to do your part. See, if I call you to get up, then you got to wake up. If the move of God is happening, don't stay in the bed. He says, understand, don't continue to walk around in the clothes of your entrapment and your, in your slavery when I call you to a new place. Put on your beautiful garments that represent a new season. And then he says this in verse seven, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. So what is he saying here? And I love this, this verse is quoted by Paul in the New Testament. Matter of fact, Isaiah is the most quoted uh, Old Testament book because we see something here. He's declaring there's a day coming. There's a day coming, a word is here. And in the preaching of the word, good news is here. There's a prophetic statement of a new day on the horizon. And then in chapter 53, he says, in the light of that word, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, picture what's happening here. Imagine you're in a tough time, a difficult time. You're facing, you're under the, the, the threat and the weight and the stress of captivity, it's, it's coming your way. And in the midst of it, you get a call that God's about to do something. And there's a promise of deliverance. And, and so now you're, you have to look at what you're going through in the light of what is said. And so the question is, who will receive our report? Who's gonna embrace what's being said? Who's gonna respond? And that brings us to the issue of the personality.
of fertile grace. For he says here in verse four, surely our grief he himself bore and our sorrow he carried. Yet we ourselves are stream him sn- a sm- a strit- stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the chastising for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed or by his wounds we are healed. The personality of fertile grace is Jesus. There's a promise of a new day but that new day will be realized in the person of Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, Isaiah's saying, there's coming a new day. It's on the other side of what you've got to face. But a new day is coming. And Jesus is the center point for you to experience the vibrancy, the wonder of that new day. There's a new day of fertile grace. And so by the time we get to chapter 54, now he says, shout for joy. You have the promise of a new day. You see the personality of the new day in Jesus. Now it's time to activate. It's time now to practice that new day. How do I practice the new day? He says, shout for joy. Shout, sing aloud, lift your voice, cry out. Well, I said these are people who were mentally and emotionally challenged and within the confines of their circumstances, they were facing their issues and it had made them infertile, sterile, in the light of their environment. In other words, they were in the box. They were living in the box. And see, when you live in the box, you begin to think in the box. You begin to function in the box. You begin to carry yourself according to the dimensions of the box and you become defined by the box. And now you don't have the ability no longer to think outside of the box. And so you live in the box, and what happens? You live in the box and you lose your imagination. You can't see life any different. You lose your creativity. Because when opportunities come or when challenges come or when circumstances come, you don't have the creative capacity to approach it from another way. You only see the problems. You don't see the answers. And it steals your excitement because now you're filled with sorrow and pain and frustration and you don't have the ability to enjoy the moment even though you're in the box. And so the charge of scripture right here is Isaiah is saying, I know you are used to this idea. This, this is what you want. This is what you want. That when you're in the box, you want God to come and take you out of the box. And then when you get out of the box, you say, oh, bless his holy name. (laughs) Hallelujah. God has been good to us. The Lord reigns. But Isaiah is saying, while you are in the box, you need to lift your voice and you need to shout with joy in the box. See, I think the way we would want to read this verse is like this. Shout for joy. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud. Wouldn't that be great? Just to read it like that. But that takes it out of the context of the experiences of their life. For he says, for shout, shout for joy, O barren one, you who have not or have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry out aloud, you who have not travailed or had the experience of childbirth. He's saying now, while you're in the box of your circumstance, begin to lift your voice. Begin to offer a shout with joy. Begin to sing unto me. Begin to celebrate me. In other words, while you're in the box, don't act like you're in the box, act like you're in me. Don't be focused on what you're going through. Be focused on what I'm going to bring you through. See, don't live in the confines of the box. Your joy, your excitement, your imagination, your creativity will be lost in the box. You've got to understand if if God calls you, if God Almighty calls you to lift your voice in the box, where is God? He doesn't call you from the outside. He's saying, I'm present right here. 
and there is fertile grace in the midst of the box. I know we like the deliverance stories. I know we like the testimonies that when God brings you out. But see, God, God likes to get some people who believe that he is still God while inside of their circumstances, while facing their challenges, while going through the difficulty and the upheaval of life, that they don't need an outcome, they have a revelation. And so while they're in the midst of it, they can begin to shout with joy. That means I begin to arrest my emotions and say you don't belong to the box, you belong to the purpose of God. Because the box would leave me in sadness and grief. But if I can begin to see God in my box, I take the lid off of my box. I may not be out of the confines of it yet, but God is gonna meet me and he will speak to me and he will enlarge me and if I can lift my voice. Now you gotta say, okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, why? would I lift my voice and shout while I'm still in the circumstance? I don't see any change. It's as unseen natural to celebrate something when you don't see anything. <laughs> it's as unseen right to be excited when you don't see something. It's unseen logical to have joy about something you don't see. But see, when you lift your voice, when you begin to shout unto God with joy, what you are doing is that you're making a decision, a conscious decision of your will to give up your right to any longer hold on to excuses, questions, doubt, fear, or anything that undermines God's sovereign authority over every circumstance in your life. That fertility has to bow before his glory. That sterility has to submit to the greatness of who he is. And so what I do, even though I don't see the change, I raise my voice to say, God, you are bigger than my experience. And so it's a, it's a commitment, it's a call to step out Step out of the absence, the mentality of absence, into the mentality of presence. See, when we are in the box, we think about what we don't have. Have born no child, have no children, no increase. If I am in the box, I'm thinking about absence, but I, if I lift my voice, I understand now I'm moving from a mentality of absence to the mentality of presence. And where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. Uh, what do you mean? I'm still in the box. But there's liberty in the box. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. See, so you're saying I'm in the box and I'm free. Yes, you're in the box and you're free. Just like Paul was in jail and he was free. That's how Paul could say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be made known to all men that the Lord is near and be anxious about nothing. Where's Paul? He's in prison. But Paul had an understanding that he wasn't living in the mentality of absence, but the mentality of presence. It is to come to a place where you exchange fear for faith. That you move from the natural and step into the realm of the supernatural. It's where you understand God can do what God can do. And if I can agree with God, if he calls me to lift my voice, if he calls me to offer him some praise and to declare the greatness of who he is, even in my circumstances. See, we face different challenges. They, they may be physical challenges, health challenges. They may be financial challenges. They may be relational challenges. They could be circumstantial things that happen in our life that tend to box us, box us in. And as much as we want to say, get out the box, how many know there's some boxes you can't get out of except by a supernatural move and the timetable of God. I said by a supernatural move and the timetable of God. And so there are things that have to happen. He says you have to change. 
You have to change. Your mentality, your approach to life, your understanding of the circumstance has to change. So lift your voice. Wait a minute, if I raise my voice and sing joyfully when everything else seems to be chaotic, then that's, that's crazy. Okay, crazy praise is what you will offer. It's a realization. It doesn't matter how other people perceive it. It's what God is calling me to. And so he says, shout for joy, O barren one. You who have, have borne no child, break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud. For you, you have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. He's saying, understand something that there is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. I'm waiting till you get it. There is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. There is coming a season of increase in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be in this present season and it has you boxed in. Maybe you're facing the consequences of wrong decisions or not listening to God. But see, God says, I'm looking past that disciplinary season. I'm looking past the challenges and moments. I'm looking past the consequences. There is coming a season of increase. There's coming a season of increase. It says, now understand, you have been looking at the married women. It's here, it's the, the picture, the analogy. You've been looking at the married woman, and they've had their children, but understand, see, they have been able to do something naturally, but you're going to do it supernaturally. There's something that's going to happen that only God can do. There's going to be a supernatural move of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. 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 Supernatural increase. And here's the challenge. See, sometimes when we go through a drought or we go through a place of barrenness and we don't have what we're looking for, what we desire, and we see other people with it, we can end up comparing ourselves with them. Comparing ourselves with them. But see, the issue here is don't look at about how they got there. So God says, I'm going to get you there. Don't measure it by them. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Don't, don't get caught up in their route. Don't get caught up in how they experienced it, how they reached it. I'm going to do it on you. I'm going to take you. You're going to get there. It's going to be a move of God. It's not going to be your cunning, your, your charisma, your intelligence. It's going to be a supernatural move. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And something fresh will be birthed through you. Now, this is still people in the box, see, who are still going through something, who are still in the face of a challenge. It says, right now, understand, position yourself ready to move in something fresh in God. So he says in verse 2, enlarge the place 
of your tent. <laughs> Stretch out the, the curtains of your dwelling. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. Your descendants will possess nations and we will resettle the desolate cities. Now, he's saying to Zion, Zion, the people of God has been lacking to a nation and as a nation has been lacking to a woman who is barren. And it was interesting enough, the responsibility of addressing the tent, maintaining the tent, making sure the tent was stable, keeping the tent together, keeping the temp tent organized was the responsibility of the wife or the woman to keep the tent in order. And yet, the woman is the very one who feels barren. And so now he's saying to the nation, he's saying, now I want you to enlarge your tent. Now, the last thing a barren woman wants to do is enlarge her tent. Because see, once I start to enlarge my tent and I don't see anything, it, it, it's going to make me confront the unresolved emotional wounds of shame and humiliation. Because in the, in the context of that day, a woman's identity was tied to a man, her husband. And the, the chief goal and one of the expressions was to be able to give him children. And the inability to do that seemed to create such a weightiness and sorrow and heaviness upon a woman. And now to said she is at this place, here's the nation again, she's at this place where she is barren and at the same time God says enlarge. So he's forcing her to deal with her pain. God will force you to deal with the pain in your life. I know we want to run from our pain. We don't want to deal with our pain. I don't want to deal with my pain. I don't, I don't run from my pain. I don't want to, you know, that's why I'm just getting away from things. I need to get a little break. I get away from my pain. But see, God will force you to deal with the wound of the thing that was unresolved. So understand, until he has access to it, he can't heal it. And he needs to put you in a position where you're willing to deal with it. And you will deal with your pain while you're walking in obedience. Oh, let me say that again. You're going to deal with your pain while you're walking in obedience. See, somewhere we have confined faith to this idea that God calls us, that God has a plan for us, that God wants to do something in us. And so when we know that, we sit back and we wait and watch and see what God's going to do, how he's going to bring it to pass. But see, the plan of God in exercising faith is not simply the idea of waiting and watch to see what God's going to do kind of like Jonah waiting for calamity. No, your role is to work with God. And he says, enlarge your tent. Wait a minute, God, why don't you enlarge it? I mean, you know, you all that. You do it. He said, no, you enlarge it. Because you have a promise. You have a personality. You have a charge of fertile grace. Now you get up and act like it's true. Wait a minute, I don't see anything. Now he forces her to have to deal with her own pain, and then he forces her to make a decision. Is she going to walk by sight or by faith? See, that's what happens. God causes things to come about in your life. God causes you to confront the things you don't want to confront and the pain that you've been dealing with so you can make a decision. Are you going to walk by sight or are you going to walk by faith? Are you going to stand under the define, definement and confinement of the box? Or are you going to stand under the definition and the will of God Almighty? And so she has to make a decision. Will I engage this process? Will I do this? Enlarge your tent. He says, stretch out the curtains. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So I got to get the tent and stretch it out. Stretch out the curtains. I got to make it broader. Now, you imagine she's out there working on her tent, stretching it out because she was ready to accommodate more people. Now, you know how it is. You know how it is, right? You do the will of God, and it, it's beyond what you're feeling at the moment. I mean, you ever had God tell you to do something and you didn't feel it? 
and you, you don't feel it because you're going through some things. You've you got pain in your life. He's saying, this is what I need you to do. And, and you're stretching it out. And, and matter of fact, here you are, and many times it happens, not in the private arena, but in the public arena. Here you've got to stretch out. If you're stretching out your tent, that means there's other tents around. And could you imagine some people saying, why is she doing that? Making her tent larger? She don't need to make her tent larger. She don't have enough to fill the tent that they have already. And imagine now having to work through that. You already got the pain of, of not seeing something. You, you're called to do something, and, and you got the buzz around you that seems to affirm your fears, your shame, and your humiliation. And yet she says, stretch out. She says, stretch out the curtains. I want to tell you something. When God is stretching you, he's stretching you so you can start stretching. When God is stretching you, he's stretching you so you can begin to do something, so you can begin to work with him to get to a larger place. I love how it's rendered in the Eugene Peterson, the message translation says, you need to think big. It's time to think. You've been too small. You let the box tell you who you are. You let the box define you. You've been thinking within the box. Now it's time to stretch out. Stretch out. He says, stretch out the curtains. He says, spare not. Now, when God commands you to do something, oh, by the way, he's not suggesting, he's commanding, right? When God commands you to do something, don't have a plan B. Stretch out. He says, don't let anything be left. Take it to the full limit. Don't have a, a backup plan. Use all your strength, all your resources to take it as far as it can go. And then he says this. He says, he says, enlarge. He says, stretch out your dwelling. He says, lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. The cords that are tied to the pegs, pull them out. Come on, get as far as they can go. And then he says, strengthen your pegs. How do you strengthen pegs? The way you strengthen pegs, you got to get them deeper down so they can handle the tension of the, of the tent. In other words, if you're going to move in this place of embracing and responding and practicing fertile grace, you got to get deeper in God. I said, you got to get deeper. Ask somebody, what do you think it means to get deeper in God? Well, let's see. I've got to take some more classes, and I gotta study some more, and I gotta have my eschatology down, and I gotta have all my details and my information down. No, 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 I'm not talking about deep like that, because there are people who are deep like that who are shallow. To be deep in God is to be obedient. To be obedient. To do what God says to do. The deep people can hear God's voice and they do it. When Isaiah had the experience, he says, who shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. That's deep. Amen. That's deep. For some of us, who will go for us? Hmm? Um, boy, I got a lot planned this summer. I don't, uh, do what? Uh, that's not going to work with my schedule. Uh, and, and so what happens, we come and we have a shallow response and a shallow spiritual walk. And here he says, here, here is this charge to begin to be deep, dig deep. Get your pegs down so you can be strong. And he says, you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. I love it. You're making the tent bigger and you get a word. The word from God is understand increase is coming. Increase is coming and it's going to fill your house. Now let me ask you this. If your house, if your tent was contingent on the level of increase, I mean, if, you're, if, you, if your increase, if your increase was contingent on how much, how large you made your tent, how large would you make your tent? I said, I'm, you get this? Let me help you. All right. If the increase that God, all the children, all the descendants, all that God wants to bring can only fit within the length and the size of your tent, however far you stretch it. How far would you stretch it? 
See, if God says, I will fill your case with money, how big would your case be? <laughs> would you have a little cute little, little purse, little kind of, would you have a little, you know, little, you know, little thing strapped on here? Would you, or would you go and get one of those humongous drag along, right? But it would cost you something and it would look kind of stupid if you dragging that down the street, right? But you ain't worried about anybody else now. You're not worried about anybody else. Because this is about to be filled, see. In so it is in the spirit. God says, enlarge your tent. If you're ready to move into a new dimension, if you're ready to experience something different, then you need to act like it. Don't sit there waiting for me. I've done what I've done. I've said what I've said. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But you need to do what you need to do in response to my word. I've given you a promise. I've shown you the personality of grace. Now it's time to embrace it. It's time to act like it's true. He says, you're about to break forth. It's about to happen. And he says, in essence, you're your descendants will inhabit these desolate cities. In other words, they are ruined cities, they're desolate cities, they're forgotten cities that are waiting for your children. That are waiting for your children. Okay, wait a minute, let's go back. Wait a minute, where are my children? Who are my children? Well, because I've been sterile, I haven't had my children. Well, what are my children? Well, my children are my imagination, my creativity, my excitement, my fruitfulness, it's been taken captive by the circumstances of the box. And there are cities waiting for us to come into our own, even though we got our own issues. And that's how God works, isn't it? God doesn't wait until you get out of your box before you become the catalyst of deliverance for somebody else. While you're in your circumstance, rise up and take the lid off the box so you can be creative to release a city. So you can have imagination to see life where there is death and light where there is darkness. It's, it's that realization that God has something so great for us. We are those descendants. We are the people who can produce the kind of change in the city. We can be that point of divine release. That's why we cannot set and let our box define us. Walking around moping over our box while people are waiting for us to have an imagination for their release. While people are waiting for us to be creative. Why we can't sit around talking about and discussing the problems and it's sitting just, to, just walking through the process of what it means in the light of the problems and pain and don't get anything accomplished. No, if we can think out of the box, we, God will give us creative ideas. Did, see, it's easy many times to see where a person is, out the box, in the box, influenced by the box, not influenced by the box. You can be in the box, but maybe nobody else will know it. Amen? But you can be in the box and everybody can know it. <laughs> see, if you come into an environment where God is being praised, and the worship of God is celebrated, and his name is uplifted, and we're calling out and worshiping him, and you're like this. Hmm. It may be that you're more cognizant of your box than about who he is in this moment. And if you can begin to respond to God, do the unnatural. Get out of the circumstances of your moment 
even while in the box. You know, in the box, like I said, your box may be a physical challenge. It may be a, a sickness you're dealing with. We're praying, we're believing, we're, 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 we're crying out to God. We're accept, expecting a supernatural touch in your body, but in the meantime, you're still there. You're still there. You need things to change financially, right? We can claim all these wonderful things and, and, and begin to talk about this, this reality of the, the resources and we can say money cometh, uh, but you know what, until it gets there. <laughs> there is still the box. There's still the box, right? You can be in a challenging marriage. You can desire healing in your marriage. You can want a, a more vibrant relationship. But until it happens, that's still a box in your world. And in that moment, can you rise up? Can you begin to lift your voice and give him that which is due to his name? Otherwise, you'll say, you know what? I got to go to church. I need to go to church. I, I want to get a word from God. And you get there and you are in the seat, in the box. And you're waiting for a yoke breaking word, waiting for something to happen, something to occur for you. And while you're in an environment where you should be engaging yourself. See, I think if you will break forth in worship, even before the message comes. <laughs> If you can declare the greatness of God and arrest your emotions and take authority over the box even though you're in it, then you're in the best position to receive what God is going to say to you. Here, we're charged. It's time not to be owned by the circumstances. It's time to step out. Do you want to see something different happen in your life? Then you got to stop doing the same thing. The same way, the same time. I mean, if you want to see something different, you got to do, you got to approach it differently. And so here, there's this charge. Do what is not natural. Enlarge your tent when you don't see increase. Stretch out when you have no evidence of something happening. Lift your voice when you're not even happy. <laughs> you are conveying something to God. God, I am conveying to you this, that I believe you, that I believe you, that I believe you, that I believe you, that I believe you. And there's power. There's the authority of the cross of Christ. I said, there's something about the cross. Now, now, Abraham, Abraham got a word from God. He didn't have any kids. And his wife was advanced in years. <laughs> and they both were advanced. Matter of fact, when you read the New Testament reference to this, it says that her womb was dry. Wow. What can happen? It's not going to happen naturally. Whatever is going to happen has to happen supernaturally. And so he says, I want you, Abraham, come on out here. Come on. I want you to look up. Count the stars. Count the stars. See, what's happening? You're getting your imagination back. You count the stars. You're getting your dream back. You're getting your vision. You lost your vision. Count the stars. Count one, two, three, four. One thousand, one, two, three. Two thousand, ten thousand, one. Boy, they're just innumerable. Yes, that's it, Abraham. So shall your descendants be. Oh, but I haven't had one yet. Abraham got a prophetic word. He was on this side of the cross. He, could, he got a word and he, he got partial fulfillment of that even on this side of the cross, descendants. On this side of the cross, before Jesus went to the cross. But see, 
on the other side of the cross was a whole nother group of descendants. <laughs> and I believe as Abraham looked at the stars prophetically, God was showing him descendants on this side, but even through the cross, descendants on the other side. And so when Abraham was counting the stars, he was counting you. He was counting you. And Abraham is the father of faith, and we are the children of Abraham, and we believe God, and we trust God. And even though we, God has us going places we don't even know where next, we believe him because God has a purpose for us. Ask somebody, are you in the box? Then don't try to impress anybody by saying, no, no, no box. I didn't. Right. I'm all right. I'm all right. You ever ask somebody that? Say, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. When it's all over them. Right? They got UPS boxes. They got FedEx boxes. They got all these. They're, just, they're all in the box. But they don't want to be honest about it. But see, if we can say, yeah, you know what? I'm facing something that right now, by my own will, I can't get out of. It won't be a natural move. My ability to step out of this, get out of this, will not be natural. It has to be supernatural. It has to be God stepping in. So while I'm here, I need to act like God is God. I will not continue to act like the box owns me. Because if the box owns me, then sadness owns me. Fear owns me. Doubt owns me. And when it comes down to it, I won't be able to trust God, believe God, anticipate God, and I'll be stuck here in the box. How many know it's time that we need to move into a new mentality to experience a new dynamic in God? Come on, stand with me.